Right, right. He charges the defendant with the murder of Kenneth Amari Ray and all the charges that go with that on December the 28th, 2010. It also has charges related to what happened on March 22nd, 2011, which was a Tuesday. Charging him with armed robbery and kidnapping and other charges related to a Jadon Brooks on that day. It also charges him with the criminal attempt to commit murder and other matters related to Officer Tony Howard. And it charges him with the murder of Officer Lady Christian. In addition, on March 22nd, you got charges relating to the carjacking, armed robbery, and kidnapping of a Deborah Lumpkin. All on March 22nd. You have on March 24th and 25th, that Thursday and Friday of that week. You have charges relating to the holding of hostages. What you have is kidnapping, aggravated assault, and other matters relating to a Shadon Janique vest. And Shirandre. Bess and Mandrell Hull and their daughter Michaela Hull. Chandra Bess and Quentin Ryden and their son Zion Ryden. <coughs> Chandra and Chandra's mother Belinda Willoughby. And Ronaldo Villas. As well as Terrence Lumpkin. All being at a location at 102 Creekstone. 70 charges that also involve the charge possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. To that indictment, the defendant has entered his plea of not guilty, and it's from that plea of not guilty that has formed the primary issue for you to try his guilt or innocence of each and every one of those charges. At this time, let me talk to you what I represent the state of Georgia to expect the evidence to show. To be Let me tell you, I'm going to describe some December 28, 2010. Kenneth Lamar Ray came back to the house that his mother lived in, that he lived in with her primarily. 360 Nottingham Drive. A neighborhood off Old Thorpe Avenue, just off the bypass here in town. Three bedroom, one bathhouse. And he returned Sometime about 8.35, it sounds like. Out of the shadows came Jamie Donnell Hood. And as he described what he did to those, did to Amari Ray, the hostage. He told him he wanted to find out where Kenyatta was. And Amari wouldn't tell him, and he shot him. Then Amari started calling for his mother, who was inside, Ruby Jordan. And as he called at her, he got madder and shot him again. And continued to do that. And shot him seven times. He took off running. Neighbors of Greg Barnett next door, Amy Orr and Scott Sutton across the street, and others heard shots. Five shots, six shots, or more. They saw a figure running come out the 
facing the street from the house, kind of running to the left in the shadows there with the hood on. Miss Ruby Jordan was inside. You see, her niece, Brittany Smith, it was her birthday. She had made her spaghetti for her birthday, and Brittany had come by earlier that day and earlier that evening <coughs> and picked up the spaghetti and had left. And Amari left about the same time. Amari Ray was 30 years old. He worked in Athens Park County Streets and Drains. He'd been working there about six years. He got off about 3.30, 4 o'clock, about an hour or so after Miss Jordan had gotten off and come home, and he'd come home. He had had plans to take Brittany to Applebee's later in celebration of her birthday. And he left about the same time she did and left, and that's when he came back. Miss Jordan was inside the house by herself. She was watching TV and heard kind of a boom or some sound. She couldn't tell whether it was shots or not. She thought she heard her son, Amari, call out her name. Three, two times. At some point, she cracked the front door and looked out. She saw Amari's car and saw a figure running. Thought it was Amari maybe chasing somebody. She closed the door. police were called by the neighbors and otherwise. There was a Michael Howington who was coming there and you will learn was likely to join them buy some drugs from Amari. He texted Amari. At 8.34, according to his phone, Amari texted back K. When he got to the house at 8.37, he texted Police department obviously arrived. Brian Border, Chris England, EMTs. He was face down by the carport. They pulled him over. He was gurgling. He still had life in him. EMTs worked on him. On the way to the hospital, he expired. process the scene. And they found six shell casings that night in the next morning. Spent shell casings. 40 cattle. That's that. There was an autopsy performed and he was shot in the neck, in the shoulders, in the arm, in and out through his chest, coming out and his buttocks. All those wounds were in and out. There were 16 wounds, if I can recall correctly. Eight entrance and eight exit. They proceeded to investigate, but didn't have any leads. They continued to work the case. And we moved forward at that point from December 28th, while that was still under investigation, to <coughs> March 22nd, 2011. And actually, just before that, on March 17th. You see, Jamie Hood had talked to Jadon Brooks about maybe starting to sell some weed. And asked Jadon Brooks for his advice about that and see what he had might be good. And he talked to him and saw him on the 17th. Of March. And he asked him about it and showed him a little bag, and Janon said, I can't tell from that. I'll have to see a bigger portion of that. And there was talk of him coming over to Omari's house, or actually his parents' house at 100 Rannick Road, which is off of Old Winnebago Road, not far from the Athens Airport. It's a train. Jamie Hood called him at 21st, 
about nine o'clock or so to come over, and he told him, "No, I can't do that, man. I, I told you." The next morning, John Brooks took his child to to daycare and proceeded to do some other things, and got a total of at least six phone calls from Jamie Hood at that time to come over, to come over, to come look at the dope to see if it's any good. Because I need to get into this. Jadon Brooks went over there. He had a Chevrolet Caprice convertible, a tan car. And arrived over there at Rannick Road around noon, a little bit before. Jimmy Hood was outside. His convertible was down. Jimmy Hood's car, the a Cadillac, a brown Cadillac, was there as well. He went into the residence there. Hood was there, and Hood directed him back to a back bedroom where the dope was, supposedly. John went in there. Shortly thereafter, three masked men came into the bedroom along with Hood, and things changed dramatically at that point. They had some covering over their face. Two of them had handguns. One of them had a sawed-off shotgun. Jadon wound up saying, what's up, Hood? You know what's up? And his demeanor changed dramatically. You know what's up? You, MS, are going to fix me and give me my money. Where's Kenyatta? You tell me where Kenyatta was. I won't kid you. He proceeded to tell him that. He told him other things. And one of the things he told, told him at that time, I'm wanted... John Brooks, at that time, they put him in plastic ties around his back. They put plastic ties around his feet. They put duct tape over his mouth. They put a covering over his face and proceeded to try to take him outside as he moved along. He could look down kind of through everything and see his feet and see the floor. Took them out. At one time, as they were going out the door, somebody was coming. They pushed them on the ground. But they wound up getting them there, as it turned out, into the trunk of the defendant Hood's Cadillac. Close it up. Proceeded to leave. Jadon Brooks, who is big man. He's actually smaller now than he was then, and you'll see a picture of him then. But he was able to break the tie on the back. His hand behind his back. Although the ties were still on. He was able to break it. He didn't pull the duct tape off just in case they came back and opened it up so he could put it back there as if he was still tied up. He was able to fiddle with the lock there, trying to find the escape patch. He was able to somehow get it open, and he held it down because it, the car was moving. And he could tell that his car was being driven behind him. He didn't know whether to go ahead and jump out with it moving or wait till it stopped. At some point, it came to a stop. As it turned out, it was at the intersection of Winneville Road and Lexington Road. As it comes in, right there across from these Carmike theaters and this gas station, and just to the right is the bypass, the overpass there. And there are two lanes at that point. There's a turning lane to the left to go out Lexington Road to Gaines School, and there's a turn to the right. Pittman's tire was located on the corner there, a used tire plate. If you turn right, you go underneath the bypass and head kind of toward town. As it turned out there was a, a Damon Taylor who was driving in his car. And in the front passenger seat was an Ernie Badger. Damon was taken getting some lunch. He was going to go pick up some lunch for his wife, Sinead Taylor, who was a teacher, had been there 
at least eight years or so at, or has been there at least eight years at Gaines School, kindergarten, pre-K, teacher. What happened when the car stopped? Jadon Brooks saw his chance. He opened the trunk and rolled out and fell on the ground. He hopped, asking him, tell him folks, help me, he was just kidnapped. He's kidnapped. Ernie Badger got out and opened the back door of Damon Taylor's car, and John Brooks got in. Hood had gotten out and went out and closed the door and took off right, as well as the Caprice. You see, Damon Taylor actually, before that happened, had seen Jamie Hood drive by in the Cadillac to stop. In fact, he says, he would put his hand up to wave at that Taylor, because he knew of him. He saw Jadon Brooks' car, and that's not Jadon Brooks driving. The two guys in there. This happened, Damon Taylor took off left. He went down to Gaines School and took a right. He actually went to McDonald's and got food for his wife and took it to his wife. In the meantime, they were calling 911. And Jadon actually called Kenyatta to tell him, be, 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 out. be on the lookout. Watch out for what's going on. He's looking for you. Or something to that effect. They went down to Gaines School to Barnett Shoals as it comes in and turn right on Barnett Shoals there at the Bank of America that's on that corner. And just past all that, there are some apartments called Stratford. And they pulled in there. Tony Kincaid was a police officer there, and he had been on that side, and he had turned off Gain School as well, and as he did and turned on to Barnett Shoals, he was weighed down by those fellows. And he was the first one there to deal with it. He saw the ties on Jadon Brooks' hands and saw his feet. Other officers arrived, Officer Tony Banks and Jay Butt. And they proceeded to cut the ties off. And those ties were covered in the picture of Jadon and the picture of those ties when they were covered at that time. He got a description, he got an indication of who this was, and he put that out on a bolo to be on the lookout for Jamie Hood and a description of the car. He was told by Jadon Brooks that he may be living near a complex called Cascades on the River. Cascades on the River is located off Sycamore Drive. Sycamore Drive veers off of Broad Street. This will become familiar to you later if you don't have any familiarity now. But on Broad Street, as you go through Athens, all the way through Athens, and come up to Hawthorne, there's a Hampton Inn on the corner there. And just past that, there's an Applebee's and a McDonald's and so forth. And there's a Hilltop Grill that's up there. As you go down a little bit further, there's uh, Howard Johnson's right before that. There's six more drive beers off. And there's a bunch of apartment complexes down there. It used to be, you know, they called Beechwood, and they changed the name of that. Beechwood Apartment. Cascades on the river, basically the complex on the left, and it has a circle, the first drive and the second drive that veers off and comes this way. On the right, just past these white office buildings, Executive Park, there's apartments I believe called River's Edge, and you can cut through from Broad Street through that to go over to Sycamore, and there's some other apartments, complexes down on the left and right, and Sycamore kind of dead ends as it gets to the river, the Company River. Put that out. He put out a bolo on the car. As the cars of the defendant were located just past the bypass, the overpass, off Lexington Road, also known as the Coney Street. As you turn right off of that Winterville Road and you go underneath the bypass, there's something called a red and black package store. And the old Winterville Road veers off. And just behind that package store, there's a street called Little Oak. 
And right there at that same intersection, another street veers off called Dublin. The Cadillac was located off Little Oak. The Chevy Caprice, Jadon's car, was located right there at that intersection at Old Winneville and Dublin. You're going to hear testimony from the defendant's mother, Azalee Hood. She will testify as she's testified previously in a matter. The Jamie Hood had called her and she picked him up off Lexington Road and took him to the McDonald's on Broad Street, just up from Sycamore. And that Hood had called his brother Matthew to come pick him up from there. Which he did. All this in a relatively short period of time. Matthew Hood was in a red suburban. Bianca Williams was riding with him. Bianca Williams got out at McDonald's and the defendant, Jamie Hood, got in to the passenger seat. They proceeded down Broad and were cutting through that river's edge from Broad over towards Sycamore. Officer Tony Howard. Had heard the call go out about Jamie Hood. Had heard the call go out about where this might be, Officer Moore, and as other officers did, an officer had responded to that area and tried to proceed to go through there because they had some idea that the defendant may live over that way. And they didn't see anything of Matt Rain, and I don't think James Moss got there. But Tony Howard. Tony kind of left out, but then he decided to go back in to that. And he saw his brother-in-law, Officer Jerry Johnson. And they proceeded to go through. point, they had different access to their phones. You know, when he, when he got them in there initially at different times, he had them kind of barricaded in the back <coughs> bedroom there, put the mattresses up against the window and everything. Threatened if they did or left or anything, what he do to the remaining folks that both left and what they did. He had them in there at different times. He'd have them out and he'd be there. And they saw white powder that they believed was cocaine that he was using. He had a gun with him at one point, he actually sent Belinda out to get some more bullets at Walmart, which she did with the understanding that she would tell anybody the blood of these folks would be on their hands. All that went on for quite a while. At some point, they were able to somehow text other people. There were just so many of them in their head that they were texting everybody about what's going on. And people started getting wondering about why didn't Belinda come to work? going on with these folks and they're not here, they're not reporting, they're not doing this. At some point while he was talking, Clinton Biden recorded his statement. He was in a short 15 second, 30 second, he had a not an iPhone or anything. Some old phone he was able to record. You will hear those recordings. At some point, Quentin was able to communicate with a, I believe it was an uncle of Jerry Wright. Jerry somehow got that information to the police who were staged near his house off that east side area. Well, 
idea of the, the Greek stone. About that same time, there were different calls coming in. But there was also communication by the defendant with a Bryant Gant. Bryant Gant was a fellow that played football here at the University of Georgia a good bit not long ago and, and grew up here in Athens. He'd gone to work with Cook Knoll, a law firm across the street here, but he also worked part-time with the athletic department. And prior to these events, he'd actually gone full-time with the athletic department to deal with the players and work with them to make sure. And he was familiar. They had a mentoring program where they had different folks in the community, mostly men, who could work with those athletes, those football players, to mentor them, to help them along their way. Tony Howard was one of those. On the day he was shot, Bryant Gant got a call from Officer King Brown telling him that Tony Howard wanted him to know he wasn't going to be able to make his dinner for him. Didn't miss him that night, March 27th. His son was still in the hospital. He was shot in the face. Put out on Facebook. If anybody knows Jamie Hood, come to contact me. I can talk to him about turning himself in. At some point, Jamie Hood did. And Brian Gant was able to record those conversations as much as he could when he had good service. He could talk to him sometimes, but if he didn't have good service, the recording would cease. But he was able to record a lot of those conversations he had with the defendant, Jamie Hood. And at some point, Jamie Hood communicated with Central, and different conversations were had with Jamie Hood that were recorded by the 911 Center. Different folks were negotiating with him and talking with him, and you will hear the tirades that he went on and what he threatened to do unless they acted and what he did. But Darren Cheney, who is with the FBI, who is a negotiator, was kind of at the end leading the negotiation with the assistance of Brian Gant, who went to the scene because there was a, it was staged off Bowley Drive, not far from Creekstone at that time. At some point it was <coughs> negotiated and worked out where he would surrender that night of the 25th, live TV. 11, 11.30 at night. He came out as well as the remaining folks He's already let Andrell and Kayla Hull leave and Quinn Ride and Zion Ride leave with the kids. He kept the women there. And the remaining folks came out with their hands up through the course of the same as Jane Hood. As he was being put in the car, he told the news report, I regret killing that enemy. done. Obviously, you can imagine on a case like this, I won't go into every single thing that was done, but let me highlight several things. Inside that duplex, 102 Creekstone, they found a Smith & Wesson 40 caliber. <coughs> and they compared it with the bullet, the four bullets to the shot Tony Howard and to the shot Tony and the four shell cases, two were related to Tony Howard's car and two Buddy Christian's cars. And it was determined that they were all fired from that Smith & Wesson 40 caliber within 102 Creekstone. And the defendant's right thumbprint was on the back of it. Back gun. They also sent off the 40 caliber shell casing found in the back seat of the defendant's Cadillac that he abandoned on Little Oak that Jadon Brooks was in the trunk of. And they sent that off as well as the six shell casings found at Omari Ray's scene. And they compared it to the Smith & Wesson 
40 caliber weapon. And they determined it was not fired from that weapon. But they did determine that all seven shell cases, the six at the scene and the one in the back seat, were all fired from the same weapon, a high point, 40 caliber. And remember, Marty Ray was shot seven times. hear something about videos and Tony Howard's car or Buddy Clips' car. Nothing was recorded. What activated because the blue lights were activated. The siren wasn't activated. When Tony Howard made the stop, it was a minimal police citizen encounter. He thought he was just going to stop and talk to Jason to Matthew Good. The way the video works, it goes into a hard drive or in the back of the trunk, and that was full. And we put it on the computer at the department, and there was nothing there. So the act their activation had never happened anyway. They went back and basically found the, the last recording of a stop or whatever Tony had done. It was in January of that year. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what I expect the evidence to show. There are close to 400 witnesses, as you know, on the witness list. We expect to call in our case in chief at this stage about 120. About 120 to do that. Maybe a few more, maybe less. burden of proof in this case is on the state of Georgia, as it is in every criminal case that's ever tried. And the burden's on us to prove every essential element alleged in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. And that burden we fully accept. And the evidence and testimony in this case will show you, I submit at the end of this, that the defendant did everything that that indictment said he did. For that reason, when we conclude, I would ask you at the end to return the only fair and just truthful verdict in this case. One of the guilty. Thank you. We're going to take a recess before we go to uh, the defendant's opening statement. I'll ask you to return to the jury room. We'll take this one restroom. We'll take 10 minutes. 10 minute recess. You <clears throat> asked a question about where you should stand. I, I, that's what I've written out. Is that my
assassinate the police. They have they have told the public that I carjacked the Don Brooks at a red light. Broad daylight trying to carjack this man at a red light. They have told the public that I murdered Kenny Omari Ray. Yeah, they say, been saying all this stuff. Murder this old Mara Ray. They have told the public that I own raw piece of liberal man George McKinney. They have told the public that I went on the murder street because I was cut out of a cut out of a drug connection. show that these are a bunch of ugly lies. They are not just lies, ugly ones.
evidence will, evidence will show something is wrong, something is greatly wrong, and why I'm facing the charge that I have. It's not hard, sir. Y'all heard of this moment? If I ain't know the truth, I got up and ran that coat on. He's on a heartless, malicious murderer. Uh, there have been some unfortunate things that happened to me in my life that led me to face these charges. The evidence will show that this case really started before March 22nd, 2011. Evidence will show that I have had some unfortunate experience with police brutality, police misconduct, and judicial injustice. With a few, that's a few of That's a few of Who misrepresented law enforcement. It's not law enforcement. It's the few corrupt individuals who misrepresent law enforcement. Now, I do not want to send you the wrong message. Because if we did not have people in law enforcement, society would be out of control. I have much respect for people who is in law enforcement who do the job the right way. I think every all the people who are in law enforcement who do their job the right way, they got to be some special people. Now, Now, the, ev the evidence will show you that my friend Edward Wright was shot to death by Andy Clark County Police Officer. Okay. That was Jack. Can you take up that hat outside the front of the I would object to that matter. I'm going to ask the jury to shut back to the jury. Judge, I would kick his jack to his reference to what happened to Edward Wright. I think he referred to what happened to Edward Wright in the 1990s. Uh, so forth. It's not at all relevant to this case. It's not expected to come out at all and should not come out in this trial. He uh, talked about, in reference to what happened to his brother, Timothy Hood, which is not expected to come out at all in this, at all in this trial. Made reference and continue to make reference about what folks may have told the public, which is not matters that would be come out during this trial at all. That this office has not made any any comment to the public whatsoever, press releases, statements, or otherwise about this case. And there haven't been matters that have been put out uh, by the prosecution in any way about this case to be applied. I would respectfully accept those personal attacks, but I would particularly accept his reference and him bringing up before the jury matters that I would submit to the court respectfully will in no way come out during the trial of this case. Uh, the events of Edward Wright, the events of Timothy Hood, and those matters like that. Yes. I know why. I'm here. I know why I'm facing these charges, Judge. I have a case to present too. It might not come out in his case, but I've got my own evidence and my own witnesses. I know why I'm here. I'm not the one trying to run if I know Supreme Court stopped the case. This him. It wasn't me. See, Judge, I have evidence. That's why I've been so adamant about representing myself, because I'm mad, really. So 
My understanding your response is that it is relevant. Yes, it is relevant because judge it's all about why. What made this man do this man? What made this man do this? About why? I know what happened in my life. I know what I did, and I know why I done it. And these are events that play a role in me facing these charges. I'm going to allow you to reference those matters, but I will stop you if you get too far. Well, if these reference start to include allegations against the district attorney's office, what they may or may not have done, and, and that sort of thing, in those cases. Okay. But I tell, you, I, I, I tell you what, Jeff. I have evidence on this prosecutor, Mr. Tim Mullen. I can show it to you right now. And, 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 see, I'm only talking about evidence. I don't bring that out my mouth that I'm not certain of. Okay. Right. You so, understand my Yes, sir. I, I got you. Right. Judge, as far as the events that may have happened with Debbie Wright or Timothy Hood, that is not relevant to come out during the trial of this case to try those cases and to deal with those matters here. And that's what I'm specifically objecting to. And that may be, very well be, but I'm going to give him some latitude in his opening. I'm not saying that that's going to be allowed when the time comes in the case itself. Yes. Thank you, Jerry. We'll be objecting to that. I, I understand. Thank you. You, you understand that, Mr. Hood? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. I was stating before you all left, the evidence will show that my friend Gilbert Wright was shot to death by Anthony Clark County Police Officer, Hack McCarty, and, and Sean Potter. On the morning of October 12, 1995, Gilbert was naked and unarmed. Mr. Hood, that is not appropriate. That is irrelevant. I won't. Okay. Based on the objection of this 
Evidence will show that my brother Timothy Hood was shot and killed by Abby Clark County Police Officer. Evidence will show that the Chief of Police, Mr. Jack Joseph Monkman, and the prosecutor Ken Malden failed to show all the family that all they're going to do is take off the police car when my brother was shot and killed by the police. The evidence will show that I was illegally convicted for an armed robbery charge that I'm innocent of. It was destroyed my life. Destroyed my life. And ultimately played a significant role in why I'm facing the charges that I had. The evidence will show that after Clark County Police Officer Ryan McGee, did an illegal identification on me by telling pieces of liberal man Charles McKean that I'm the suspect in this warrant. Your Honor, I would object to those matters that relate to his own robbery conviction and the facts of that case back in the late 90s. That is not something that would be relevant in trial of this case because we try that case at this point. Your Honor, it is relevant because Again, when we talk about why, I want them to know why I'm facing the charge that I have. Well, and the objection you might thank, you. thank you very much. Again, I was illegally convicted for a crime I'm innocent of. As you just saw Mr. Marlon jump up and try to stop y'all being that. I was listening to Mr. Marlon give me an open statement. I would write down all them lies he telling y'all. I take Georgia pride and being here as a pro se defendant and standing up to the role that I played in the charge that I had. I wish a few others could have had integrity that I had, such as Mr. Mr. Mall. Maybe he might learn something from me after I'm finished with it. That is an issue that we've addressed. Okay. The evidence will show that when I was in Athens, Clark County Jail, 1997, 1998, on that illegal, on robbery conviction, I met Officer Tony Howard. Tony Howard physically beat me. The evidence will show that Tony Howard physically beat me because I caught him having sex with the preacher wife. The woman he is, he is now married to now. I'm going to show you evidence about that. But you got to Tony Howard was saying, Award game, y'all just all saw it. University of Georgia, 50 yard line, he do no wrong. Evidence will show a bunch of lies. I don't know how I'm going to do no wrong. Take the preacher wife and beat folk and everything up. The evidence will show that when my brother Timothy Hood was murdered by the police, he called me to have nightmares. He called me to hear his voice on certain occasions, which played a significant role in the charges that I have. The evidence will show that while I was in prison, I got a few disciplinary reports. Got to tell you about it. However, the evidence will show that I never put my hands on officers. I never physically put my hands on no police officer, no correction officer. Can't show you that. Now, am I telling y'all something to say? No, I'm not. Y'all gonna get some things about me I'm, I'm not proud of. Evidence will show also while I'm in prison, I got my GED. I got my automotive certification. Evidence will show I need years of free labor for the state. 
which made me feel like I was a slave. The evidence will show that once I got a Prius, I could not get a job because of this illegal armed robbery felony conviction on my record. Tried to work. Armed robbery felony. Armed robbery felony. I even went to the WIA program. They paid me to go to school, which I obtained my CDL license. But again, this illegal armed robbery conviction against me couldn't get a job. I was listening to him tell y'all about matters. I am. He didn't tell y'all the little league football coach did it. They were able to show that I was the coach of a 9 to 10-year-old youth football team. He failed to mention that team. It's all about revenge. He tried to kill the police. We're going to get him. We want you, boy, there. Y'all don't tell me what y'all heard. I'm not trying to run. I'm not asking no plea bar. As I told you, not, it's not about me. It's about righteousness. You got to stop. What if it happens again or something work? What are they going to say? Take a good 50 yards out of the yard and pull it all back again? <laughs> the evidence was shown that I could not get a job, which led me to call a drug dealer that I made in prison. That's how I started getting in contact with Jadon Brooks and his King Yard Camel Cat. I started dealing with him, started selling drugs. Didn't have nothing about to buy. Don't tell me you'll work me for free. And then when I get out, I can't get no job. What did you do that? If a man willing to work, why not let it? If a man willing to do good, why not let it? You endorse crime when you do not let people do the right thing. My drug dealer was Jadon Brooks and the gang members who also sold drugs led to this horrible day of March 22nd, 2011. Old Jadon Brooks was saying, you put him in the trunk. Evidently showed you Jadon Brooks was a gang banger, a drug dealer. Just ain't Jamie. Police brutality and police misconduct by Officer Tony Howard led to this police shooting incident on March 22nd, 2011. The evidence will show that Mr. Howard violated every protocol that was in the Athens Clark County Police Department. I'm listening to this guy's statement. As he lied to y'all in my face. I guess he think I'm a country boy from Elmwood. I don't know that. Small town idiot. All they do is rap me the raw field of kill. We can say anything. He can't read or write. Yes, I can, Mr. Moore. show that the police chief, Joseph Jackson Lumpy, and Mr. Mullen right here, Tony Howard Carr got a camera in it, audio and video tape. They put them cameras on the car for a reason. I was labeled as a carjacking suspect. That's a high-risk, dangerous suspect. How can you tell us you got the camera on? You know why they don't want y'all to see
Y'all heard it for here. Y'all told me you seen the man on the news. They come out the house. And it's been four and a half years. Y'all ain't tried yet. What takes you so long? I can run like country boy in the woods, been running. And I ain't gonna stop till I get it. Oh, persistent. I'm gonna tell you what hurt me more than anything. I never seen Buddy Christian Mother. And he lost his life. Still here, standing tall as a man. Not no street punk, but a real grown man. Everything will show at this stage. I was involved in a massive manhunt. Slept in the woods by myself. But again, I'm country. We played the woods all the time, you know. I'm looking at him on TV. They have to have a show and make him turn himself in. I say, buddy, Chris, your mom and daddy. On TV, I'm watching them. There's a possibility I could still be out there. Didn't know where I was. I know he didn't tell y'all that. Thank you. Mr. Baldwin. 